basketball, the jump shot, free throws, the NBA, Kareem Abdul-Jabbar, setting a screen. Basketball is man-to-man -man or zone defense. But basketball is more than this. It's practicing the same shot over and over again. It's a right-handed player learning to dribble the ball with his left hand. And it's dedicated and determined teamwork. Hello everybody, I'm Wayne Cody. And we're in Seattle talking with Lenny Wilkins, the coach of the NBA Seattle Supersonics. Lenny, you were an all-pro guard in the NBA, a player coach, and now you're the coach of the Seattle Supersonics. But when did you first start playing basketball? Well, it goes back, uh, Wayne, quite a few years ago in Brooklyn, New York. Uh, I guess I had to be about sixth, seventh grade. I used to go to Catholic elementary school, and they used to play CYO basketball, and they only were allowed so many kids on a team who lived out of the parish. See, I lived out of the parish. I was in another parish, and really we, because we had moved. And so I was never able to be on any of the teams. But I played baseball was the first sport I played. And, uh, and I kind of got interested because most of my friends and cousins, a lot of cousins I had were playing basketball. But they would never pick me to be on a team because I was the worst player there. <laughs> in fact, they used to get together every Saturday, and they would, the priest would let them in the gym. And they'd lock me out. <laughs> they wouldn't let me play. And it was kind of frustrating. Uh, we in, in New York, uh, you'd have to sit on the sideline and wait your games. And, and this was going on as I was progressing to the eighth grade and first year of high school. And I would sit on the sidelines waiting for my next. You know, we used to have next. And you'd sit there and you'd choose your own team. And after waiting about five games, I'd choose my own team and we'd get out there and play and uh, call me a heaver. And then this priest friend of mine uh, saw that I really had this interest in the game, so he started to work with me. And the first thing he did was to line up about 10 cheers and start making me dribble in and out of them using both hands so that I could get the feel of the ball. Lenny, did you play other sports as well? Yeah, baseball was the first sport I ever played. Uh, you couldn't be a Brooklyn Knight and not play baseball. I mean, you know, that was against religion, really. So that was the first sport I ever played. And of course, I played sports that a lot of people wouldn't be familiar with. Uh, one of them was stickball. And that was a New York game. We, you know, you see how many sewers you could hit the ball, that type of thing. And we would play with a little, sort of like a tennis ball without the fuzz on it. Are there other sports which are particularly good for young basketball players? Swimming is a big sport. Now, I swam a lot as a kid. Uh, and we used to go to the pool or out to the ocean. And I think that's a tremendous sport for young people playing basketball. I think that volleyball is exceptionally good because in volleyball, like basketball, you use almost every part of your body. You know, you're stopping, you're going, you're turning, you're jumping, you're reaching, you're stretching. All these things are used in the same sport. And uh, soccer is another one because you're building the stamina. Uh, you know, you look at some of the athletes today. When I was coming up, you had to learn to play 48 minutes a game. And uh, so you had to have that type of stamina. And I think in soccer, it gives it to you. What about actual basketball drills, Lenny? You know, you mentioned chairs. Chairs can be very boring, but the thing that we were doing, because we didn't know all the drills that you know today with the ball, the chairs were very interesting because it taught me to get around those chairs as quickly as possible without bumping them and switching hands. And the thing that I felt that as I became more and more comfortable with that ball and being able to do things I wanted, then I progressed to learning to shoot the ball. You went from drills to competition as a guard. Now you're a coach. Anything different about being a coach instead of a player? Well, when I was a player, I thought it was pretty exciting, uh, you know, to be actually out there competing, involved. Uh, I loved to, to play in the pressure situations. I loved having the ball uh, when it was down to one point or two point because I, I felt totally confident that either I was going to score or I knew I could get the ball to the right guy that would get us two points. And over my career, I've seen guys who didn't want the ball, you know, and I, so if I played with a guy, I'd make sure he wouldn't get it and make sure it would go to the right person. But uh, the competing part is kind of exhilarating, I thought. I mean, I love the competition of it, and it was a phase of my life, you know. Um, in coaching, I find that uh, I didn't have as much control 
I mean, even though as a coach you can prepare your team and get them to understand certain basic things and this is what they should should do and this is what they shouldn't do, but once they're out there <laughs> and the official throws the ball up, they've got it. And you're on the sideline trying to, you know, get them to do it, you know, and talk them into this and talk them out of that, but it's all from the sideline. See, you're not out there involved in it. And as a guard, I can control that. And, and of course, as a coach, you can't. So I think that's why coaches probably get more ulcers because as a player, uh, sure, I'd be upset after a game, but I knew that I had to prepare for the next game. So immediately I'd hit that game and I'd go on and get ready for the next game. There are opportunities in basketball for almost everyone. There are age group teams and school teams all the way through college. And of course there are local and national amateur leagues, even wheelchair leagues for the handicap. And size doesn't have to stop you. Some leagues limit the size of players that are eligible. You see it's your skills more than your size which are most important. In every case and at every age, you need to learn what happens on the court. What do the guards do? What role will the forwards play? How does the center contribute to the team? Playing positions in basketball. Lenny, you played as a guard during your NBA career. Now, what does it take to be a good guard? Well, I think to be an adequate guard, really in today's game, I, I think the, the one basic fundamental, and, and you know, there are about four or five fundamentals and then we go off from there. But I think the one basic fundamental is that the player has to be able to handle the ball. And when we, say, when we say handle the ball, that means dribbling the ball very comfortably so he doesn't have to be looking down using both hands. He has to be able to pass the ball well. Because the guard position, I think, is probably the most difficult position if he is a true guard. And that is that if he has these skills, okay, then his responsibilities become very great, uh, such as he is the guy who has to initiate the offense. And you come down to court, everything begins out front. The guard is the guy who's bringing the ball down court, so he has to initiate the offense, make the right play or the right move to start it off with. And if he has trouble handling the ball, he can't do that. If he, if he can see the defense, then that will dictate where the pass goes. But if he's concerned about the ball, he can't do that. He has to handle the ball on fast break. I mean, you know, we have some big people who handle the ball well, but most of the time, we want that guard in the middle because he's at, he's at his comfort zone. He will see the people coming down on the wings. He'll know when to pull up, when to make the pass, that type of thing. So he's got to be able to handle a fast break. What about the forward spot? Now, he has to read the floor from a little different position. He sees pressure coming down on the guard. I think one of the smartest forwards that, that I ever played with was Bob Pettit. Uh, Bob Pettit, when I came to the Hawks, if other teams started to pressure or press me, Bob Pettit would immediately come up high and set a screen so that I could go off of him. He has to be able to rebound. I think in today's game, he has to be able to handle the ball well enough to make a pass. Now, we're not talking about a pass where a guard penetrates and creates a situation. We're talking about a pass where if the pass comes into him and the guard goes, like a give and go situation, he should be adequate enough to give it back to him. Uh, he has to be able to score points. I mean, I don't think that we carry that many defensive people today in the game. I mean, because the game is just going by them. So he has to be kind of an all-around player. Lenny, we talked about guard and forward. Now, how about the center? The center spot has become kind of a key spot. Uh, I think that in, in today's game, you're seeing the center position uh, and the guard position interrelated because most clubs will run their offense through centers and therefore the center has to be able to handle the ball. He almost has to handle it like a guard. And when I think about that, I always think about Bill Walton, you know, one of the finest ball handling centers in the league. He has to be kind of the intimidating force in the middle to shut down teams who constantly penetrate. And a team that doesn't have a center that can do that usually is in trouble. He is the guy who is key on defense because usually the center is the one who is behind everybody. 
and therefore he has to talk and that's what we try to get him to do is to talk to the rest of the people on the floor telling him all right watch the screen on your left watch the screen on your right he has to talk with the forward and guide him through switching situations so he's kind of our catalyst back there defensively and we've got to have him talking when he talks and the rest of us can go and do things he has to be able to score points too because if he didn't score then they would just drop off him and slough off and help other people I think the guy who has proved it year in and year out was Bill Russell. I, I think the guy changed the game. He really did. Uh, when he came in, Bill had such great reflexes. I have never seen a center with the tight reflexes that Bill Russell had in so far as timing a rebound or blocking a shot. Uh, Bill really was a master of psychology in the game when it first started, so far as the intimidating type of psychology. And he would do it in some instances as a, he would come over and he'd block a shot when you wouldn't believe he could get there. And the next time the player would come into the lane and he'd be so concentrating on looking for Bill that he would miss the shot and Bill wouldn't even be there. Lenny, we talk a lot about team play in basketball. Now, of the centers playing today, who would you pick as an outstanding team player? Bill Walton, because Bill Walton is the epitome of an unselfish player who he can score, but yet he, he delights in making the pass. Uh, he rebounds. He doesn't block as many shots as Bill, but he will block some and he'll be intimidating. And you know that you just can't walk down the middle. Bill is a leader on the floor. And not that many centers are leaders. He's a leader. He's the holler guy. He's the guy that rallies them around. Bill will key the offense. I mean, he keys the offense more than the guards on his team. The words guard, forward, and center tell what position you play on the team. You have a special offensive and a special defensive role. But wherever you play on the court, you'll be expected to have practiced the individual skill of shooting that basketball. Shooting skills. Lenny, how do you decide when to shoot a jump shot, or when to go in for a layup, or maybe when to try a hook shot? The defense will always dictate what kind of shot you're going to have in a ball game. Um, I think one of the biggest things in shooting is being able to have good body control. If you have good body control, that is why you see a guy who's shooting a fall away make it. Or if a guy who is uh, going to the basket and then gets his legs taken out from under him and yet he still can maintain his upper control where he can put the ball up on the board and it goes in. Or a guy who gets fouled sometime and he's falling. I mean, he's got that concentration along with that control that he can make the shot. What's the important thing to remember when you're shooting the basketball? The basic fundamentals that we talk about in shooting is, uh, you will hear it discussed all the time, and, and they remain the same, such as uh, fingertip control, because when you shoot the ball, as you release the ball, it, it's really coming off of your fingers. You know, your thumb is there to help guide it, but as, it, as you release the ball, it's coming off of your fingers, and that's what's controlling, and as you follow through, you kind of push it in the ball, you get that nice back spin on the ball. Um, you have to spread your hand so that you are able to get that type of control. The other thing is, you hear them say, put your elbow in, into your side, point it down at the ground, okay? The follow through is very important on a shot, and, and all we mean by that is that when you shoot the ball, you gotta extend your arm and through the shot to make sure that it gets there. And the thing I tell young kids is that if you make sure it gets there, okay, even if it's a little long, it might hit the backboard and go in, it might hit the back of the rim and bounce it. But if it's short, it's never going to go in. Now we see Bill Walton and Kareem Abdul-Jabbar and other centers shoot the hook shot. And then we see guards pumping in jump shots from like 18 or 20 feet. Are there certain shots which you only need to learn if you play at center or maybe at a guard spot? I think that in shooting, Players, uh, particularly young players, should learn to have a good repertoire of shots. Learn all the shots. Um, I think one thing that helped me being small was being able to shoot a hook shot. 
because after a while I was able to shoot that hook shot driving across the middle of the lane and that way the big guys couldn't get to me all the time. You know, I'd see Wilt Chamberlain squatting in his squat position ready to come up. Well, then I knew I'd release it and he had no way he could get to it. Lenny, when we watch a ball game, it looks like every player's shooting style is just a little bit different. Now, is there any one best way to shoot the basketball? Now, styles of shooting vary from player to player, and I don't think anyone can say any one style is the correct style because you'll notice the styles will vary, but the fundamentals are the same. Let's talk for a second about going in for a layup. The layup, a, a shot that we take for granted and so oftentimes you see it missed in a ball game. A layup, um, I think the easiest way to make a layup is to use the backboard. And this is something that we teach young kids is that the easiest way is to, is to use that backboard. Now, depending on your size, your height will, will dictate where you should take off on the ground. I mean, you should be able to take one step and kind of go up to the basket. And if you're coming in for a left-handed layup, all right, then you usually step off of your right foot going up to the basket. If you come in for a right-handed layup, you go off your left foot and extend up to the basket. Are there any secrets to being a good free-throw shooter? You know, as we watch television or see NBA games, some players maybe touch their socks first or others always bounce the ball three or four times. What does it take to be a good free-throw shooter? Well, I don't think there's any tricks. I think that uh, the one thing you have to have is concentration because that is where your concentration is greatest, that you need to draw on it. And the reason being is that at that time of the game, everything is quiet. Uh, your teammates are on a foul line watch on the lane watching you along with the opposing team. The fans are either screaming at you or for you. So you have to have the real concentration that is necessary to make the basket. The other thing is that a player, when he goes to the foul line, has to be relaxed, okay? He has to be, what we say, comfortable on the line. So what I tell my players is, when you get up in the line, get ready for the shot. Don't be standing there daydreaming. Get ready for the shot. You see, the fundamentals are the same so far as, you know, getting the good fingertip control and, you know, your elbow in point on the ground. And, and cause we all have a, a spot that we concentrate on. You know, some players is just over the front of the rim. Some will concentrate for the back of the rim if you're shooting for the rim. Uh, either way is good. It's whatever is comfortable for you. I have kind of a little game that I made my players use. It's sort of a game, but it kept their interest up. Is that before practice, all my players have to shoot 25 free throws. After practice, they have to shoot 25. And then we would divide them into two teams. And we tell them, all right, you have to make 11 straight free throws and uh, Coach Harbaker would watch one group and I'd watch the other. And 11 straight, that means you only shoot one at a time. So you rotate around. And if you miss, you start all over again. And that's where the real pressure is, because that's what, like a game, you know, you're tired, you're worn out, and you only get to shoot two free throws on a game at a time. You don't get to shoot 25, see? So we make them move around. And now the first team that shoots their 11, that makes 11 straight, they can go in and shower. The rest of the guys gotta stay out and shoot 25 more. So if the 10th guy misses, they're starting for 11th straight again. <laughs> and it's happened many times. Have you had them out there half the night at all? <laughs> well, I tell you. <laughs> Eventually. So after a while, they, they get a little upset and they really start <laughs> to concentrate. As a player, you know how much concentration it takes to shoot the basketball. But the ability to concentrate is really needed all during the game. It's one of the basic skills in basketball.
basic skills, offense. Lenny, what about improving your ball handling skills? Now, we know that, you know, guards have to handle the ball a lot of the time, bringing it down the court and setting up the offense, but you've mentioned the need for both forwards and centers to be able to control the ball also. Now, as a coach, how do you help players to improve their basic ball handling skills? I think there are a number of drills that uh, we talk about. Uh, there's a drill where we can kind of dribble the ball in and out between your legs, a figure eight type of drill. And when you do, of course, you're switching the ball to your off hand. Um, we get kids doing that for a while and they get the feel of the ball and then we make them close their eyes and do it so that they have to use both hands in doing that type of thing. Um, dribbling um, down the court sometimes, we'll make them dribble all the way down the court and kind of spin, dribble, reverse, turn around using just one hand. Uh, I teach my son like um, the cross, what we call a crossover dribble. It's a move where you start the person going to your left and you switch the defense will come and step up and you have to switch the ball over to your right hand and go to the basket that way. I mean, you can do that a lot. And I think the thing that you have to do, you start out where you don't make it difficult for them. Like, I start him out just taking one or two dribbles with his right to the basket. And as he gets comfortable doing that, now we increase it to three and four dribbles with his right hand and keep making him go at it. But it's like anything, it's repetition. Lenny, what about making an accurate pass? I think that you have to read what your teammate is doing and you have to read what the defense is doing in order for you to make a good pass. Because many times, uh, sometimes the passer will make a pass to his teammate, the defense will step in and steal it, and everyone blames the passer when maybe it wasn't the passer's fault. Because in pressing situations, you have to step to the ball and help the passer. But he has to be able to read, okay, the defense, and he has to read his teammate. Sometimes we see a player dribble the ball between their legs or maybe pass it behind their back, and some people might think they're trying to be a hot dog or something. Is there a proper time in a game for that type of move? There's no question about it. I think it is advantageous to players to, who can be able to do that. But sometimes, because of the way the defense plays you, I think it's, uh, if, if I'm starting to make a move to the basket and you jump in front of me on my left hand, if I could bounce the ball between my legs and get to the right hand immediately and go by you, that's the shortest route to the basket. See, I mean, it's better than having to turn all my back completely around and trying to get back to the other side. So uh, I think it is advantageous. Sometimes when a player goes to the basket, and I used to do this, uh, I would penetrate and go to the hoop and get the big guy who would really come up and try and block my shot, and then I would take the ball and pass it behind my back. Some people talk about certain centers playing high post or low post. Now, what do these terms mean? Yeah, high post is strictly when you bring your center, usually it's your center, you bring them up to around the foul line and you run different types of plays off of what we call a high post because he's up high, which means away from the basket. And usually they run what they call split games where the guards will split off or maybe one guard will cut off or whatever. Um, low post is when they post down close to the basket and we try and maybe get the ball in so that the center can go one-on-one -on -one by himself or we might split off the low post down deep and so just high and low just means that at high he's up around the foul line low means he's down close to the basket another term we hear about is setting a screen now what does that mean okay a screen or you'll hear some people use the terminology as a pick a screen is is where your teammate you're coming down the court with the ball your teammate will come up and plan himself so that you can run the guy who's guarding you off on him or you can pick him off as you go by. Now, it's not just, you know, the player, he can't come and just stand there straight up. Uh, a guy who sets a screen should be able to spread and make himself as wide as possible so that if I'm driving off, if I have the basketball and I try and dribble past and wipe my man or rub him off on you, if you're spread out and you're wide enough, then the chances are I'm going to get him and he's going to have a difficult time getting around you. How do you know which side is the strong side of the court? Okay, the strong side of the court is usually uh, when you come down the court and most teams will set up where they have two guards out and two forwards down and then, and then whatever side the center is on, if the ball is on that side of the court, you'll have three people on that side and that's your strong side. Where you have only the two people, that's the weak side.
play in basketball is extremely important, and not just when you're running set offensive plays. You might need to help out defending against your opponent's hot shooter. Two smaller players working together can often effectively stop a larger player and shut down his game. Everyone needs to know where the opponents like to shoot from on the court. The entire team needs to help protect those areas at all times. Team defense is often the first step in a strong offense. Playing fundamentals. Lenny, we've talked about offensive skills. Now, what does it take to be a good defensive basketball player? Well, I think the first thing in defense is that you have to be willing to work and extend yourself a little bit more. You have to work hard. It's easy to work and extend yourself offensively because everybody likes to shoot the ball. But defense is nothing but hard work. Now, other than that, to be a good defensive player, once you begin to challenge the man with the ball, you, know, you have to get into what we call a good defensive position, which naturally means you're between him and the basket, but you have to be able to uh, get your weight distributed so that it's on the balls of your feet and not, you're not standing on your heels. Now, if you stand straight up and you're trying to guard a player and he gives you a fake, if you're on your heels, you're going to fall backwards or you're going to be off balance. But if you get what we call a semi-crouch position where you kind of bend down a little bit and you get on the balls of your feet, you know, you kind of like, I used to tell players, it's almost like a, a cougar or a lion. You know, when he's ready to pounce on something, you see him get in a crouch position because that means he can go any way he wants. The same way with you. If you get down in that position and you let someone try and fake you, you'll find that you've got good balance and you can move to your right, you can move to your left, you know. And in moving, uh, we teach players never to cross their feet. You shuffle across. See, you shuffle your feet across. Because once you cross your feet, and then if the player changes direction, you'll get tangled up and you're going to fall backwards. Now we've talked a lot about the basic offensive skills of shooting and passing, but rebounding is also important as an offensive play. Now what does it take to be a good offensive rebounder? I think it's a rarity or it's a unique ability when you have a player who gets a lot of offensive rebounds, such as a Paul Silas. Uh, which Paul Silas has proven to a lot of young players that you don't have to be a great leaper. A lot of it is positioning, knowing when to move, where to move. You know, I mean, Paul is kind of an active guy underneath the basket. If you watch him, he's never standing still or in the same position. And so, therefore, it's very difficult for the defense to block him off because he's constantly moving. A uh, shot goes up, he's sliding by you. He doesn't give you a chance to put your body on and hold him out. And that's some of the things that make him a great offensive rebounder. Lenny, when you were playing, did any coach ever give you any extra hints to improve your rebounding skills as a guard? Well, I was taught when the ball was passed into me, and even before it was passed into me, I should have looked down court and seen where everybody is and know exactly what is taking place. That's the same way with a rebounder. When he, as he goes up, he should have gotten a picture and know where his teammates are. Bill Walton does this fantastically. Defense is nothing but hard work. You can also earn nothing less than pride in yourself when you do the job. Contributing on defense means knowing the skills, learning positioning, and how to avoid being faked out. There are other things to consider. How much time is left in the quarter, or in the half, or in the game? What's the foul situation for both teams? Which players on both teams shoot better under pressure? You see, adding this information to the physical skills of the game 
you're on your way to becoming a team player. Teamwork. Money, when you're sitting on the bench, how can you help your team? Well, I, I think that when you're reserved, the one thing you have to recognize is that one, you know, everybody can't play. But while you're sitting there, you feel, okay, if the coach calls on me, I'm going to be ready to make my contribution to the game. And so the thing that I'm going to do while I'm sitting there is I'm going to be watching the game. Like you say, you have to be in tune with what's happening out there. Now, if I'm a guard or if I'm a forward or a center, then naturally I'm watching those positions. I'm watching to see what the other team's forward is doing or what his center is doing. You know, uh, what can I do that maybe would offset him? You know, I'm putting myself out in that game and saying, how would I handle that situation out there? So I want to be ready. I watch for any little mistakes the other team makes or something we did that was good. I listen in the huddles to what the coach is telling the other guys so that if he calls on me, I'm right in tune when I get out there on the floor. And, and I think, you know, the funny thing about it is when I first started uh, pro ball, I sat on the bench. I wasn't a starter. I didn't become a starter until halfway through the season. And I was always so ready to go. I, it, you, I was like Joe Hassett. I scored one time seven points in a minute and a half, <laughs> you know. <laughs> and that was, you know, it was kind of exciting for me. It was just funny. The guys teased me about it, but I was just that eager to play, and I was that ready. And if he was going to call on me for one minute, or 10 minutes, I was going to be ready. Now, if you're prepared like that, then most of the time when you go in the game, you will have some effect on the ball game. The guy who isn't, who sits there and pouts, well, now he's not in tune with the game, and when he gets in, he'll make mistake after mistake, and he just can't get going. In any league of basketball, Lenny, there are players on a team who might be called all-stars. In fact, throughout any playing career, you have an opportunity, I'm sure, to play with very fine athletes. And is there any key when you put a group of all-stars together? How do they play together? Uh, the thing that all-stars have to learn when they're playing together that when you get behind by six or eight points, the only way we can get back in the game is by getting one bucket at a time and doing it with together. You know, so often all-stars, you get behind, all of a sudden I feel, well, I'm going to get it back for us, right? I'm going to do it. So he comes down, he takes three or four bad shots, and, and now instead of being now six, you're down 12, okay? Now the other guy, he's irritated because he watched that. When he gets it, he's going to shoot it, see? So you have to have that unselfishness where you're going to move it around, where you're going to blend into what the team, do whatever it's necessary for the team to win. A lot of people say that basketball is now a game for seven footers. Is basketball really just a big man's game, Lenny, or is size really that important? Well, size definitely helps, but I think it's the determination that you as a person have. If you have the ability and you have the determination, the desire and the discipline, and really want it bad enough, I think you can achieve it. And I think it's been proven. Uh, I'm just a half an inch over six feet. They always list me as six one, and I played 15 years. Calvin Murphy is five eleven. Uh, Charlie Chris, a rookie this past year, he's about five ten. So there are people who are that size, but I think that. The thing is never being the discouraged. You know, like when I was a kid, even though guys told me I couldn't play, and you know, I had a guy tell me I was the worst defensive player in the world. <laughs> and, and I just wasn't gonna buy that. I just kept working. I was gonna prove him wrong. And I think if you have that within yourself, then most of the time you will succeed. How to play basketball. From one of the top stars for years in the NBA, and now one of the top coaches, Lenny Wilkins.